welcome back to our channel, where we delve into the darkest corners of the human mind. If you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you never miss a story that could very well keep you up at night. Today, we're unraveling a tale so perplexing. It challenges the very fabric of what we understand about human behavior and psychology. Imagine a man living a seemingly ordinary life, a radar specialist, a husband. Now imagine that same man being a monthly subscriber to Victoria's Secret Catalogs. Not for the reasons you might think, but for something far more sinister. Charlie Brandt, a name that might not ring a bell. But by the end of this video, it's a name you'll never forget. A man who lived two lives, one in the open and another in the shadows. A man who was not just a husband, a brother, and an uncle, but also a killer. But what makes Charlie Brandt an enigma is not just the crimes he committed, but the psychological labyrinth that even experts find hard to navigate. Was he born a killer or did something snap? And if something did snap, what was it? And most importantly, how many lives did he truly extinguish? Stick around as we dissect the life, the crimes, and the deeply unsettling psyche of Charlie Brandt. Trust me, you'll want to stay for this one. Alright, folks, let's win the clock back and take a look at the early years of Charlie Brandt. Because to understand the monster, we first have to understand the man. And let me tell you, the signs were there, even if they were ignored or misunderstood. Charlie was born to Herbert and Ilse Brandt, German immigrants who had their own journey to America. They were a family on the move, hopping from Texas to Connecticut, and finally settling in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Herbert, Charlie's father, was a hard-working man, climbing the corporate ladder at International Harvester. But what was it like for young Charlie, the second child in this migrating family? By all accounts, Charlie was a good student, but don't let that fool you. He was also a shy kid, struggling to adapt to new surroundings every time the family moved. And let's not forget, he had an older sister, Angela who would later play a significant role in his life. Now, here's where things take a dark turn. The family loved vacationing in Florida, a place where Charlie would go hunting with his father. Sounds like a wholesome family activity, right? But what if I told you that during one of these trips, Herbert shot and killed their family dog while hunting? Could this have been a catalyst for what was to come? Fast forward to January 3, 1971. Charlie is just 13 years old. On this fateful night, he walks into the bathroom where his parents are. His mother, eight months pregnant, is in the bath. His father is shaving. And Charlie, he's holding his father's handgun. What happens next is the stuff of nightmares. He shoots both his parents at point-blank range. His mother and the unborn child die instantly, while his father survives. Charlie then goes to Angela's room, gun in hand. But the gun jams. Angela manages to calm him down. But not before he tells her he can't remember what he just did. A trance-like state, Angela would later describe it as. Three psychiatric evaluations couldn't determine what triggered this horrific act. And because of his age, Charlie was sent to a psychiatric hospital for just one year. No criminal charges. And then he was back. Back into the very family he tore apart. Are you getting chills yet? Because I am. What could possibly lead a 13-year-old to commit such an act? And was this a one-time incident or a sign of darker things to come? All right. Folks, buckle up because we're about to dive into a night that would forever change the course of the Brandt family. A night so chilling, it's hard to wrap your head around it. January 3, 1971. Mark that date, because that's when the Brandt family was shattered, quite literally. Picture this, Herbert Brandt is in the bathroom, shaving. His wife Ilsa, eight months pregnant, is taking a bath. It's a seemingly normal evening in the Brandt household. But then, the bathroom door swings open, and in walks 13-year-old Charlie, holding his father's handgun. Without a word, he shoots both his parents at point-blank range. His mother and the unborn child die instantly, while Herbert miraculously survives. But Charlie doesn't stop there. He heads straight to his sister Angela's room, gun still in hand. He pulls the trigger, but the gun jams. Angela, in a desperate struggle, manages to calm him down. And here's the kicker. Charlie tells her he can't remember what he just did. He's in a trance-like state, a state that only breaks during his struggle with Angela. Angela eventually flees the house, seeking help from neighbors. Charlie follows her, knocking on a neighbor's door and chillingly stating, I just shot my mom and dad. When the police arrive, Herbert identifies his own son as the attacker. Now, you might be wondering, what led to this? What could possibly drive a 13-year-old to commit such a heinous act? Charlie himself would later attribute it to a combination of things related to school, and even alluded to an incident during a family vacation in Florida where his father shot and killed their dog. But the psychiatric evaluations, they couldn't pinpoint a trigger. And because Charlie was too young to be tried for murder under Indiana state law, he spent just one year in a psychiatric hospital. Imagine that, a family torn apart, a mother and an unborn child dead, and the perpetrator, a 13-year-old boy, is back in society after just one year. The family never spoke of the incident again. 
and Charlie's two younger sisters grew up believing their mother had died in a car accident. Are you feeling the weight of this yet? Because this is just the tip of the iceberg. What happens next is even more mind-boggling. Alright, so we've just covered the night that forever altered the Brant family. But what about the aftermath? What goes on in the mind of a 13-year-old who's just committed such a horrifying act? You'd think psychiatric evaluations would provide some answers, right? Well, let's get into it. After the shooting, Charlie was subjected to not one, not two, but three separate psychiatric evaluations. Now, you'd expect these evaluations to unveil some deep-rooted psychological issues, some sort of explanation for what triggered this chilling act. But here's where it gets perplexing. The evaluations couldn't determine a trigger. That's right, no definitive answers. Charlie himself claimed he couldn't remember the act, describing himself as being in a trance-like state. He attributed the shooting to a combination of things related to school, and even mentioned an incident during a family vacation where his father shot their dog. But the psychiatric professionals, they were stumped. No diagnosis could encapsulate what drove Charlie to commit such an act. And here's the part that will make your skin crawl. Because he was too young to be tried for murder under Indiana state law, Charlie spent just one year in a psychiatric hospital. One year. And then he was released back into society, back into the custody of his family, who never spoke of the incident again. So, what are we left with? A young boy who committed an unthinkable act, psychiatric evaluations that provide more questions than answers, and a society that wasn't equipped to handle such a complex case. It's a recipe for a future filled with uncertainty and, as we'll see, more darkness. Are you intrigued yet? Because we're about to delve into what happens when Charlie and his family try to move on, as if sweeping this all under the rug could somehow make it disappear. Okay, so we've just delved into the enigma of Charlie Brandt's mind, or rather, the lack of answers we have about it. But what happens when you take someone like that and try to give them a fresh start? Well, let's find out. After his release from the psychiatric hospital, the Brandt family made a drastic decision. They relocated to Ormond Beach, Florida. Now, you might be thinking, new place, new beginnings, right? But here's where it gets eerie. Charlie's father and two younger sisters eventually moved back to Indiana, leaving Charlie and his older sister Angela behind in the care of their grandparents. A fragmented family, trying to move on but forever marked by that fateful night. Charlie even managed to get a degree in electronics and landed a job as a radar specialist. He got married to Teresa Terry Helfrich in 1986. But get this, no relatives were invited to their wedding. It's as if the family was still haunted, still trying to keep their distance from the past, or perhaps from Charlie himself. His sister Angela and her husband advised Charlie to tell Terry about the murder of their mother, but it remains unclear if he ever did. Could you imagine holding a secret like that in a marriage? It's like a ticking time bomb. And here's the kicker. Charlie and Terry settled in a beach house on Big Pine Key in 1989. A picturesque setting, almost like something out of a postcard. But as we'll soon discover, paradise can hide some very dark secrets. Are you on the edge of your seat yet? Because what comes next is a series of events that will make you question everything you thought you knew about this case. Don't go anywhere, you won't want to miss this. Alright, folks, we've just talked about how Charlie Brandt seemed to be starting anew in Florida. But as we all know, you can change your scenery. But can you ever really escape your past? Let's delve into Charlie's marriage and the secrets that loomed over it. In 1986, Charlie tied the knot with Teresa Terry Helfrich. Now, here's where it gets spine-chilling. No relatives were invited to their wedding. Can you imagine? A life-altering event like marriage. And yet, it's as if Charlie was still an island, isolated even within his own family. His sister Angela and her husband had advised him to come clean to Terry about the dark chapter in his past. The murder of his own mother. But did he? We don't know. And that's what makes this all the more unsettling. Imagine being Terry, sharing a life with a man who might be harboring such a grim secret. It's like living on a fault line, never knowing when the ground might give way beneath you. And let's not forget, they settled in a beach house on Big Pine Key, a dreamy location that could easily be the backdrop of a romantic movie. But as we're about to see, this idyllic setting was nothing more than a facade, a mask that hid the grim reality. So, what do you think? Could a marriage built on such shaky foundations ever stand the test of time? Or was it doomed from the start? Hold on to your seats, because what comes next is a storm that no one saw coming. All right, everyone. We've just unraveled the enigma of Charlie's marriage and the secrets that may have been lurking there. But now, let's fast forward to 1989, a year that would add another dark chapter to Charlie's life. Buckle up, because this one is a roller coaster. In 1989, the body of 38-year-old Sherry Parisha was found floating near the North Pine Channel Bridge at Big Pine Key. Her throat had been slashed, her head nearly severed, and her heart was missing. The brutality of this crime was beyond imagination. 
And the most chilling part, this gruesome scene unfolded less than a thousand feet from where Charlie lived. Now, you might be asking, how did they connect the dots? Well, it took years, but the puzzle pieces finally fell into place. Terry, Charlie's wife, had confided in her brother-in-law that she suspected Charlie in the Parisho killing. He had come home with blood on his shirt that night, claiming it was from filleting fish. But was it really? The case went cold for years, but it was finally solved in 2006 thanks to the relentless work of Monroe County investigators. And guess who was at the center of it all? Our enigmatic Charlie Brandt. The case was officially closed, but the questions it raised were far from over. So, what does this tell us about Charlie? Was this a one-time act, or was it part of a pattern? And if Terry suspected him, why did she stay? The answers to these questions are as complex as the man himself, and they set the stage for even more shocking revelations to come. Okay, folks, we've just navigated through the murky waters of a cold case that was chillingly solved. But now, we're catapulting forward to 2004, a year that would forever change the narrative around Charlie Brandt. Trust me, you're not ready for what's coming. September 2004, Hurricane Ivan was barreling toward Florida, and Charlie and his wife Terry evacuated their home. They were invited to stay with their niece, Michelle Lynn Jones, near Orlando. Seems like a typical family gathering during a crisis, right? Wrong. This was anything but typical. Michelle kept in touch with her mother and friends during the visit, but something was off. She told one of her friends that Charlie and Terry had an argument after drinking. And then, radio silence. Michelle stopped answering calls. Friends grew concerned. And what they discovered was beyond horrifying. Two days later, a friend found Charlie's decomposing body hanging from the rafters in Michelle's garage. He had hanged himself. But the horror didn't end there. Inside the house, the bodies of Terry and Michelle were found. Terry had been stabbed multiple times, and Michelle, Michelle had been decapitated and disemboweled, her heart and organs removed. The sheer brutality of it all was staggering. Police found that Charlie had an extensive collection of surgery-themed books, posters, and even searched online for autopsy photos and snuff films. It was as if he had been studying, practicing for this very moment. But why? What led him to this gruesome end? Charlie's 2004 tragedy was not just a crime, it was a cataclysm, a storm of blood and darkness that left everyone questioning, who really was Charlie Brandt, and how many more secrets did he take to the grave? All right, everyone, we've just been through a roller coaster of emotions, haven't we? From the shocking brutality of the 2004 murders to the enigmatic life of Charlie Brandt, but now, we're about to peel back another layer of this complex case. Buckle up, because this is where things get even more unsettling. After the gruesome discovery of the 2004 murders, investigators were left with more questions than answers. What could drive a man to commit such heinous acts? And was this his first time? The search for answers led them to Charlie's residence on Big Pine Key, and what they found was nothing short of chilling. Charlie was a monthly subscriber to Victoria's secret catalogs, but that was just the tip of the iceberg. His home was a treasure trove of darkness, filled with surgery-themed books, posters, and clippings. He even frequented websites that showcased autopsy photos and snuff films. It was as if he had a hidden obsession with human anatomy and violence against women. The meticulous nature of the murders suggested that Charlie had experience, that this wasn't his first rodeo. His job required frequent travel, so investigators began to dig into cold cases that matched his modus operandi, not just in Florida but across the U.S. and even abroad. The investigation led to the solving of the 1989 murder of Sherry Parisho a case that had gone cold for 15 years. But could there be more? Police reopened 26 unsolved murders dating back to 1973, looking for any trace of Charlie's involvement. The results, inconclusive, but the suspicion lingers. Charlie Brandt's obsession wasn't just a passing interest. It was a dark, consuming passion that may have driven him to kill again and again. And the most haunting question of all, how many more secrets did this man have, and how many more lives did he ruin? Okay, folks, just when you thought we've uncovered all there is to know about Charlie Brandt, we're about to venture into an even darker territory. So far, we've talked about confirmed cases, but what about the ones that are still shrouded in mystery? Let's dive in. After the reopening of 26 cold cases, investigators were on high alert. They were looking for any pattern, any clue that could tie Charlie to more unsolved murders. And while they couldn't definitively link him to more crimes, there were a few that raised eyebrows. First up, the 1978 case of Carol Sullivan, a 12-year-old girl abducted from a school bus stop in Volusia County. Her skull was found in a bucket, and she was presumed to have been decapitated. Charlie was 21 at the time and lived in the same county. Coincidence, maybe, but it's a lead that can't be ignored. Then there's the 1988 case of Lisa Saunders. She was found beaten, stabbed, and dragged from her car in Big Pine Key. Her heart was missing. Was it taken by an attacker or eaten by vultures? The ambiguity makes it all the more haunting. 
And let's not forget the 1995 case of Darlene Toller, a sex worker from Miami. Her body was found missing her head and heart, wrapped in plastic and dumped near a highway. A highway that Charlie frequently used, and his mileage record showed an entry for 100 miles on the day of her murder. While none of these cases could be definitively linked to Charlie, they all bear the hallmarks of his gruesome modus operandi. It's a chilling thought. Could Charlie Brandt have been a serial killer with a body count far higher than anyone ever suspected? Stay with me, because we're not done yet. The next section will delve into the psychological aspects of this case that are just as perplexing as they are terrifying. Alright, folks, we've covered a lot of ground so far, but now it's time to delve into something that's both fascinating and deeply unsettling, Charlie Brandt's modus operandi. This is where we get into the nitty-gritty details that make your skin crawl, but also make you wonder how could someone be so precise, so surgical in their brutality. Buckle up, because this is where it gets intense. Charlie Brandt wasn't just a killer, he was a killer with a peculiar set of skills. His efficiency in killing his wife and niece in 2004 wasn't just a result of rage or impulse. It was methodical, calculated, and eerily precise. The way he stabbed his victims, the way he dissected them, it was as if he had medical training. Remember the 2004 tragedy? His niece, Michelle Lynn Jones, wasn't just killed, she was decapitated and disemboweled, her heart and organs meticulously removed. This wasn't the work of a novice. This was someone who knew human anatomy inside and out. And let's not forget, when investigators searched his residence, they found an extensive collection of surgery-themed books, posters, and clippings. He was even a regular visitor to websites featuring autopsy photos and snuff films. It's as if he was studying, preparing, honing his craft for each gruesome act. But what's even more chilling? The police believe that his surgical precision indicated past experience. This wasn't a one-off, this was a pattern, a signature style that could potentially link him to other unsolved murders. So, what does this tell us about Charlie Brandt? It tells us that we're not just dealing with a killer, but a killer with a level of expertise that makes him all the more dangerous, and all the more enigmatic. Alright, if you've made it this far, you're clearly as intrigued as we are to understand the mind behind the monster. We've looked at Charlie Brandt's life, his crimes, and even his surgical precision. But now, let's try to get into his head. What psychological factors could possibly explain his actions? Let's dive in. Charlie Brandt's life was a series of contradictions. A good student but socially awkward. A loving husband but a secretive man. A seemingly normal guy but with a hidden obsession for human anatomy and violence. These contradictions make him a complex subject for psychological analysis. Let's start with his childhood. The 1971 incident where he shot his parents and killed his pregnant mother is a glaring red flag. He was just 13. Psychiatric evaluations failed to pinpoint a reason for this violent outburst. Was it a one-time snap, or the first manifestation of a deeper, darker psychological issue? His sister Angela described him as being in a trance-like state during the incident, which only broke after their physical struggle. Could this indicate a dissociative state? Or perhaps it was a manifestation of some form of psychosis? Then there's the secrecy. Brandt never spoke of the incident again, not even to his wife Terry. This level of compartmentalization suggests a high level of emotional detachment, often associated with sociopathic tendencies. His obsession with human anatomy and surgical procedures is another disturbing element. It's as if he was fascinated by the very thing he destroyed, human life. This could point to a deep-seated need for control, a way to master what he couldn't understand. And let's not forget, he was never criminally charged for the 1971 incident due to his age, and spent just a year in a psychiatric hospital. Did the lack of legal consequences and inadequate psychiatric intervention embolden him? Did it give him a sense of invincibility? Unfortunately, we may never fully understand what drove Charlie Brandt to commit such heinous acts. But one thing is clear, his mind was a labyrinth of complexities that contributed to his life of secrecy and violence. Alright, folks, we've delved deep into the mind of Charlie Brandt, but what about the people who lived with him, loved him, and called him family? How did they cope with the realization that someone they knew so well could be capable of such atrocity? Let's get into it. Charlie's family was a complex web of emotions and secrets. After the 1971 incident, the family never spoke of it again. His two younger sisters lived under the impression that their mother had died in a car accident. Can you imagine the shock when they eventually found out the truth? His sister Angela, who was almost killed by Charlie, had a particularly complicated relationship with him. She managed to calm him down during that fateful night in 1971, but what was going through her mind all those years later? Did she ever suspect her brother could be a serial killer? And how did she reconcile that with the brother she knew and loved? Then there's his wife, Terry. She married Charlie without knowing his dark past. Even if she did find out later, she chose to stay. What does that say about her? Was it love, denial, or something more complex? We can only speculate. His father, who survived the 1971 shooting, 
also presents an enigma. He moved back to Indiana with Charlie's two younger sisters, leaving Charlie and Angela in Florida. Did he ever suspect that his son could commit more crimes? Or did he, like many others, choose to bury the past? The family's silence and seeming denial raised many questions. Was it a coping mechanism? Or were they too afraid to confront the reality of who Charlie was? Either way, the emotional toll must have been immense. Alright, we've talked a lot about Charlie Brandt and the people closest to him, but what about the communities he lived in? How did they react to the shocking revelations about a man who was, for the most part, a ghostly figure lurking in their midst? Buckle up, because this part of the story is just as chilling. In Fort Wayne, Indiana, where the first known violent act of Charlie's life took place, the community was left in shock and disbelief. A 13-year-old boy shooting his parents. It was the stuff of nightmares, and it left a lasting impression. Parents held their children a little closer, and the neighborhood was never quite the same. Fast forward to Florida, where Charlie spent most of his adult life. When the news broke about the gruesome 2004 murders, it sent shockwaves through the community. People started locking their doors, questioning their neighbors, and eyeing strangers with suspicion. The tranquility of the Florida Keys was shattered. And let's not forget about the cold cases that were reopened as a result of the investigation into Charlie. The community had to relive the horror of unsolved murders, wondering if Charlie was the monster behind them. The police even had to reinvestigate 26 unsolved murders dating back to 1973. Can you imagine the collective fear and speculation? Local media played a significant role in shaping public opinion. Stories about Charlie were splashed across newspapers and TV screens, each revelation more shocking than the last. It was a media frenzy that left the community grappling with a mix of fear, anger, and morbid curiosity. The impact on the community was profound and long-lasting. Trust was broken, and a sense of security was replaced by a cloud of fear that hung over the towns Charlie had once called home. All right, folks, let's talk about the media circus that surrounded Charlie Brand. This was a story that gripped not just Florida or Indiana, but the entire nation. The media was all over it, and for good reason, this was a tale that had everything. Family tragedy, unsolved murders, and a man who was an enigma even to those closest to him. Newspapers, TV channels, and online platforms were filled with headlines that seemed to come straight out of a horror movie. The media's role in this was a double-edged sword. On one hand, it brought attention to the case, which could have been instrumental in solving other cold cases. On the other hand, the sensationalism often overshadowed the victims, turning their tragedies into tabloid fodder. But one thing's for sure, the media coverage made Charlie Brandt a household name for all the wrong reasons. It's a name that would be remembered, discussed, and analyzed for years to come. Now, the question on everyone's mind, could any of this have been prevented? It's a haunting thought. Charlie had shown signs of violent tendencies from a young age. He had even been institutionalized, albeit briefly. Yet, he slipped through the cracks. Could more rigorous psychiatric evaluations have made a difference? Could law enforcement have connected the dots sooner? These are questions that will haunt the families of the victims and the communities he terrorized. While we may never have all the answers, this case serves as a grim reminder of the importance of mental health intervention and the need for thorough investigations. It's a lesson we can't afford to ignore. And here we are, at the end of this twisted journey. Charlie Brandt remains an enigma, a man whose true number of victims we may never know. His story is a chilling testament to the darkness that can lurk in the most unexpected places, even within our own families. While some questions have been answered, many more remain. The true extent of Charlie's crimes may never be fully understood, leaving a lingering sense of unease. So, what do you think? Could Charlie have been stopped sooner? What are your thoughts on this perplexing case? Leave your comments below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more deep dives into the darkest corners of the human psyche. Until next time, stay safe out there.